Good evening. Welcome to tonight's lecture, Has Science Buried God at the University of Chicago? This is part of the Chicago Festival of Thought with RZIM. Tonight's speaker is Professor John Lennox. John Lennox is an internationally renowned speaker on the interface of science, philosophy, and religion. He regularly teaches at many academic institutions, including the Said Business School, Wycliffe Hall, and the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, as well as also being a senior fellow with the Trinity Forum. He has written a series of books exploring the, ex the relationship between science and Christianity, including God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God, God and Stephen Hawking, and Against the Flow, The Inspiration of Daniel in an Age of Relativism. John has also participated in a number of televised debates alongside many of the world's leading atheist thinkers, including Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Peter Singer. His hobbies include languages, amateur astronomy, bird watching, and some walking. <laughs> Welcome also to all those of you joining us on live stream. After the speech, there will be time for Q&A. Kelsey will explain then how to get all of your questions into Professor Lennox. So without further ado, here is our speaker. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to this illustrious university. I think the first time I discovered how distinguished this university was is when I was in my fourth year at Cambridge doing mathematics. And one of the professors here had just written the longest mathematical paper that had been written up until that point. And it filled an entire journal edition. And I was in his first class at Cambridge because he'd become professor there. There were about 20 of us. So he walked into the class, never having lectured at Cambridge before, and he placed this heavy volume, one copy each, on our desks. And we looked at it, it was about that thick. And then he walked to the front and uttered the following memorable words. He said, ladies and gentlemen, the first hundred or so results of this are trivial, so we'll start at 101. <laughs> there were two people in the class the next day. <laughs> but your university has got a wonderful record, particularly in my subject, but in many other subjects. And so it's an absolute delight to see you all have come, and thank you very much for coming. I had a very different group in front of me this morning. I had three or four hundred midshipmen at the U.S. Navy Academy in Annapolis. And we had a wonderful time of discussion. So I'm looking forward to the same thing happening here in the University of Chicago. And to help that, I would like you to be thinking of questions as I speak, not when I finish, as I speak. And you have cards, and you can write those down, and we collect them afterwards, and then we look at as many as we can. Our topic is, has science buried God? And it's a very odd question in a way, because looking at it naively, first of all, what is science? It's a set of intellectual disciplines that study nature. How could studying something out there that's a given in any way be an argument against the existence of a creator who put it there? You know, we scientists ought to be quite humble people because we study a given with a given. We didn't put the universe there, although to listen to some people speak, you think they had. And the mind, we didn't invent it, the human mind. So we study a given with a given. Now, of course, there's much more to it than that. And on the screen in front of you, you see me encountering some of the most vocal people in the world who feel very strongly that science has buried God. The picture on the right is of the Natural History Museum in Oxford, and the Tyrannosaurus rex is in the middle, and Dawkins and I are on each side of the Tyrannosaurus rex, and its colossal head loomed between us as we debated, and we were both terrified that it would collapse on top of us. And this extinct animal would make both of us extinct. So Dawkins and I had this debate in the very place where in 1860 there was a debate between Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, and Bishop Wilberforce 
on the implications of Darwin's origin of species, right in this place. The bottom picture on the, the right is my debate, or one of the debates with the late Christopher Hitchens, who wasn't a scientist. He was a literary person and a, a reporter and a journalist. But he felt also extremely strongly, and said so, that science had buried God. And there's a very widespread impression around the world that that's exactly what had happened, that you've got science over here and God over there, and the two won't meet. I was talking to a physics PhD student just a few days ago in another city in the States, and he said when his colleagues in the research department discovered he was a Christian, they said, you shouldn't be doing physics. I mean, you can't possibly believe God and do physics. And so we had quite a discussion about that, because what I'm going to suggest to you is not only is science not buried God, but faith in God and faith in science sit very closely together. But the fundamental point is the conflict isn't between science and God at all. It is easy to see that. There are two Nobel Prize winners in physics. Perhaps another one is going to rise from this room. But Steven Weinberg won the Nobel Prize for physics. He's in Austin, Texas. He's an atheist. Charles Townes, who invented the maser, leading to the laser, a Christian. Now think about those two men. They have both won the Nobel Prize. What does that mean? Well, they are brilliant at physics. Their physics doesn't divide them. What does divide them? Their worldview. Weinberg, an atheist, and Towns, a Christian. So what I want to suggest to you, in order to help you navigate your way through this debate, is the first thing to take on board is it's not a simplistic conflict between science and religion. Or you would expect every Nobel Prize winner to be an atheist. Perhaps you didn't realize that between the years 1900 and 2000, over 65% of Nobel Prize winners believed in God. That shows you that the problem lies elsewhere. And it's a very real one. It's a conflict between, for our purposes tonight, atheism on the one side and theism, in my case, Christian theism, on the other. So looking at these uh, two worldviews, they distinguish themselves by the way in which they answer the big questions. And one of the biggest questions is, what is ultimate reality? What is the really real? And on the atheist side or the naturalist side, the universe is all that exists, or the multiverse. There's no transcendence. On the theistic side, the universe is not all that exists. There is transcendence. There's a God that created it and who upholds it. And so, ultimate reality on the naturalist side is mass energy. Well, it used to be mass energy. Now it's got even more interesting because it has been reduced to a quantum vacuum, and Lawrence Krauss goes even further. Ultimate reality is now nothing. And I give lots of lectures on nothing these days. It's a very interesting thing to talk about. There may be some questions on it. On the theistic side, ultimate reality is not nothing, it is God. And it's not the universe either. Now, these have implications for something that's going to be central to our discussion. And that is, what do we mean by explanation? In particular, what do we mean by scientific explanation? Now, if you're a naturalist and there's no transcendence, by definition, all explanation must be bottom up. Putting that another way, all explanation must be reductionist. You must be able to reduce everything to physics and chemistry. But on the theistic side, both directions of explanation are possible. There's bottom up and there is top down. Of course, on the naturalist side, the claim is that the universe gives no evidence of God. And on the theistic, certainly on the Christian side, the universe does give evidence of God. So to sum up, we have two conflicting worldviews, and there are scientists on both sides. 
So what's the real question? Well, the real question, as I understand it, is where does science fit? Does it lead to naturalism? Does it lead to theism? Or does it lead nowhere? Is it completely neutral? Now, how do we investigate this kind of a thing? Well, one of the problems is that an intellectual fog is hanging over the Western world, generated by certain thinkers whom I shall name. <laughs> and very often, it gets blocked at the very beginning by some title like the God Delusion. And of course, delusion is a psychiatric term. So this is claiming to use psychology, psychiatry, which is a scientific discipline, to say, well, there's no point in thinking about God because God is simply a Freudian projection. And it leads to people making statements like this. Stephen Hawking, interviewed by, I think, The Times, religion is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark. Well, they were very kind in asking me to reply. So I did in the same length of statement. I said, atheism is, on this basis, a fairy story for people afraid of the light. Now, of course, that proves nothing. But the point is, assertion doesn't carry the day. And the next principle I'd like to suggest is statements by scientists are not necessarily statements of science. And there's an example of one. And my reply wasn't a statement of science either. We have to look elsewhere for evidence. And perhaps I should say, just as an aside, I do get rather fed up by leading scientists accusing me of believing in God like other people believe in Santa Claus. This happened in the Netherlands not long ago, and there were well over 2,000 students there and people. And I was accused, my God's like Santa Claus. So I said, let's test it to the audience. So I asked this question. I said, ladies and gentlemen, how many of you came to believe in Santa Claus as an adult? Not a single hand went up. And then they said, how many of you came to believe in God as an adult? And hundreds of hands went up. And I turned to this professor and said, with great respect, sir, please don't insult our intelligence. Some of the brightest minds that have ever existed have wrestled with the big questions of the existence of God. They've studied the Bible. They have fought. Indeed, they outthought their competitors. I don't notice such a volume of literature about Santa Claus. This is just nonsense. And so we need to cut through that, and we need to recognize the next big thing creating a fog. And the next thing creating a fog is in a way, it seems a very simple concept. It is the concept of faith. What is faith? Well, we use it with several meanings. First of all, religion, the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, and so on. But we also use it more commonly, actually, as our subjective response to something. I believe this. That is, I have faith in it. I trust it in a fact or a proposition or a person. The problem is, those two meanings get confused in the debate. And to make things massively worse, in Webster's Dictionary, if you look it up afterwards, there's a new entry. And it says this, faith, noun, believing where there's no evidence. But that's not faith in the ordinary sense. Faith comes from the word uh, fides in Latin. And uh, it means trust. And we all know what faith is. We trust our friends. We've got reasons for trusting them, and so on and so forth. But the so-called new atheists, led by Dawkins and the late Hitchens and Sam Harris and so on, they have very cleverly redefined faith to mean believing without evidence. So they meet somebody like me, and they say, you're a man of faith. And that's about the biggest insult they could say, because it means Lennox believes where there's no evidence. But that is a very cheap intellectual cop-out. Now, let me make clear to you, other faiths must rightly speak for themselves. But the Christian faith is evidence-based faith. The fundamental doctrines of the New Testament summed up by the Apostle John at the end of the fourth gospel. He says, Many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe 
that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, this is the evidence upon which belief, faith is based. But because these atheists regard faith as believing where there's no evidence, they write some very interesting things. Dawkins, a case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. Faith, here comes the definition, being belief that isn't based on evidence is the principal vice of any religion. That's because they have redefined faith as blind faith. But that leads to some, I find them very amusing absurdities. For instance, Richard Dawkins again, atheists have no faith, and then he writes a 400-page book on what he believes. That's sheer nonsense. Peter Singer, whom I debated, the Princeton professor, atheism is not a faith. And I asked him, don't you believe it? He says, yes, I do. <laughs> so it is his faith. We've got this curious idea which paralyzes intellectual debate, that religion involves faith. Nothing else does. But that in itself is also very dangerous. I leave Christopher Hitchens aside, except for the last point. Our principles are not a faith. Our beliefs are not a belief. That's where you get to when you get messed up in the definition of faith. But there's a deeper problem here, and it's this. When people think that faith is only a religious concept, and secondly, it means believing where there's no evidence, they completely miss the fact that faith is essential to science. And indeed, what we find with these people that say they have no faith is almost an unlimited faith in the power of science to answer every question. Bertrand Russell put it this way, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods and what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Now, Russell was quite a mathematician, logician, and philosopher, but his logic, well, he forgot his logic when he wrote that sentence, didn't he? What science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. But can science discover that sentence? That's not a statement of science. And so if it's true, it's false. It's logically incoherent. Far wiser was Sir Peter Medawar who said, that a Nobel Prize winner, the existence of a limit to science is made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things. How did everything begin? What are we all here for? What's the point of living? Now, I'm passionate about science, but we do it a disservice, Medawar says elsewhere, if we think it can answer every question. It can't. In fact, it doesn't deal with the most important things in life, like beauty and love, and so on. Now, we'll pursue that a little bit later. But as we look at this question, are science and God compatible, we need to ask, what are the sources of evidence? Now, I'm a mathematician, and people often challenge me to prove the existence of God. And here we run up against another ambiguity, the meaning of the word proof. As a pure mathematician, go back to Euclid, if ever you did go back that far, and think of the axiomatic method. Start with these axioms, use that logic, and come to these conclusions. That kind of proof you do not get in any other branch of science, let alone any other intellectual discipline. In physics, chemistry, engineering, all these other disciplines, we can't speak of mathematical proof. But we can speak of evidence. We can speak of powerful evidence that gets us beyond reasonable doubt. And that doesn't mean it's weak. I trusted an A380 to get me to Washington exactly a week ago. I couldn't prove to you mathematically that it would get me there. But I risked my life on it, didn't I? I couldn't prove to you mathematically that my wife, to whom I've been married, the same one, for 48 years, loves me. But I'd stake my life on it. In other words, we can stake very big things on proof that's not absolutely mathematically watertight. We do that all the time. And we need to understand that that is true. Now, 
in that spirit, let's ask ourselves, where would we get evidence from? And I'm going to suggest that evidence comes from three major sources. First of all, the history of science. Secondly, the nature and philosophy of science. And thirdly, the results of science. I said a moment ago that scientists are believers, not necessarily in God, of course, but they believe in science. That is, they believe science can be done. That is, they believe in the rational intelligibility of the universe. That is, they believe in the mathematical intelligibility of the universe. And the interesting thing is, look back in history, if you can, to the time of the early pioneers of modern science. They all believed in God. Kepler. Galileo, Newton, all were believers in God. Did that hinder their science? No, it was the motor that drove it. And C.S. Lewis put it beautifully when he said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. Now, this is the roots of science. And it's why many of the major universities in the world, Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and so on and so forth, have or used to have biblical mottos because the people that founded them were theologically literate. They were also literate in many fields and they saw no contradiction. And one of the main reasons for that is the essential role that Christianity played in the rise of modern science. One of Australia's most distinguished uh, historians says the book of creation is the origin of modern science, the book of Genesis. And when you trace through these people, Galileo, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forgo their use. Kepler, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. Newton, don't doubt the creator because it is inconceivable that accidents alone could be the controller of this universe. And then we take a great leap in history. Isaac Newton occupied a chair in Cambridge, in Trinity College. Up until recently, it's been occupied by a person that you'll instantly recognize, Professor Stephen Hawking. He was just ahead of me in Cambridge, and he's light years ahead of me as a mathematician. A genius bound to a wheelchair. And there was quite a shock rippled through the Western world when the London Times announced, Hawking, God did not create the universe. Now, this fascinates me. Think about it. Isaac Newton, I'm going to specify it because it could help us navigate through this problem. Isaac Newton, who discovered the law of gravity, believed in God. More than that, he used the law of gravity as evidence that there was an intelligent creator. In the Principia Mathematica, the most famous and most brilliant book in the history of science, he expressed the hope that his book would help the thinking person to come to believe in a deity. Now, here's the interesting thing. Stephen Hawking, he uses gravity as a reason not to believe in God. The heart of his book, The Grand Design, which he co-authored with Leonard Mladenov, says, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. I, I find this intriguing. Newton uses gravity to believe in God. Hawking uses gravity to deny God. Well, what do we do now? We think. And we ask ourselves the question, how do we get from Hawking's, uh, sorry, Newton's theism to Hawking's atheism? And I want to suggest there are two major reasons. The first one has occurred to me only in the past few years. The second one occurred to me a long time ago. The first one may surprise you. 
Stephen Hawking, you see, quite directly says to people, you must choose between science and God. Now, I know the power of the pressure. Stephen Hawking hasn't yet won the Nobel Prize. I hope Hawking radiation is discovered and he wins it. But when I was your age, 19 or so, I was at Cambridge, and one night we had dinner, and I found myself meeting my first Nobel Prize winner. Never met one before. And of course, I, as a student, was in absolute awe. But still, I decided I would enter into conversation with him. And since he thought so much about the universe, I thought I'd ask him one or two of these big questions. And he didn't like it at all. And um, at the end of the dinner, he said, Lennox, please come to my room at once. I thought, what's this? And he invited three other professors, no students. So I went to his study, and they set me in a chair, and they stood around me. And they said, Lennox, do you want to make a career in science? Yes, sir. Right, in front of witnesses tonight, you give up your infantile belief in God. Because if you carry on with that, it's going to cripple you, your peers are going to reject you. You'll never make it. Give it up. That's pressure, ladies and gentlemen. I'd never known anything like it, but I'm so glad it happened. Because somehow, I got the courage, I believe, from God to say, Sir, what would you offer me that's better than what I've got? And he said, well, the theories of Bergson. Well, I knew about them, fortunately. And I listened to him for a couple of minutes, and I said, sir, I'm sorry, but I'm going to stick with what I've got and take the risk. And so now, many young people, I wrote a book, God and Stephen Hawking. Why did I write it? Because a, a young person in Ireland was driving along the road in his car and saw this, Hawking says there's no God that you saw a moment ago. And he nearly crashed the car. He was a Christian. And his thought was, if Stephen Hawking says there's no God, who am I to say there is? The pressure is enormous. You've got to choose between God and science. You can't have both. So I decided I'm going to investigate what's going on here. And the first thing I discovered is Hawking doesn't mean the same thing when he uses the term God as I do. What Hawking is thinking of is like the Greek god of lightning. That is a kind of god of the gaps, as we call them. You know, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. And the ancients couldn't understand lightning, so they postulated a god. And you just do one class on atmospheric physics at Chicago, and that god disappears, you see. Science has done a great job in burying a whole lot of gods. But you see, and you see what god of the gaps is from this marvelous cartoon. Uh, there are two scientists there at a blackboard, and there's a very complex equation on the left, a very complex equation on the right, and in the middle he's written, then a miracle occurs. And one scientist says to the other, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Now, that is the opinion of many people, that we're simply pushing God into the gaps in our knowledge. We don't yet know how this works, so we say, God did it, but a bit more science, and God gets squeezed out until he disappears like the smile on the face of a Cheshire cat. Isn't that what happens? Oh, sorry, I didn't show you the slide, but there it is. Okay, now I want you to follow the logic of this. What suddenly occurred to me is this, that if you define God as Hawking does, as Dawkins does, to be the explanation for what science has not yet explained, then of course you have to choose between science and God, because that's the way you've defined God. Do you get that? You've actually defined God in opposition to science. So no doubt you have to choose between the two, but you see, the God of the Bible is not a God of the gaps. Any of you, I'm sure some of you at least, have written, um, have read the, the first a statement in the Bible. It goes like this. In the beginning, God created the bits of the universe we don't yet understand. Well, of course it doesn't say that. But that's the view. What it says is God 
created the heavens and the earth. That's a Hebrew merism, meaning heavens and earth are two extremes. God is the creator of the whole show. And that's very different. He's the creator of the bits we do understand, the bits we don't. But note this. When Newton discovered his law of gravity, understanding what I'm just saying, he didn't say, now I've got a law of gravity, I don't need God. No, he said, what a brilliant God to do it that way. And that's the way you think, isn't it? The more you know of engineering, the more you can admire the brilliance of a Rolls-Royce engine, not the less. The more you understand of art, the more you can admire Rembrandt, not the less. The more you know about the universe and how it works, the more you can admire the God who created it, not the less. Now, this is enormously important because it refocuses it. A lot of the debate today is pitching science not against the creator and upholder of the universe, but against a Greek kind of God. But if you know anything about the ancient world, and I'm fascinated by ancient gods, I even write about them, you will know that they are utterly distinct from the God of the Bible. And one of the most distinguished thinkers in this is a, a man called Werner Jaeger. And he wrote a book on the Greek gods. And um, he says, the gods of the ancients, not only the Greeks, all appeared from the basic matter of the universe. All those mythologies have a not only a cosmogony, but a theogony, how the gods were generated. And for the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, Egyptians, and Romans, they came out of the primeval cosmos. So, almost literally, they are material gods. And then Jaeger says, the god of the Bible. Whereas the Greek gods were descended from the heavens and the earth, the god of the Bible is utterly distinct because he created them. To put them in the same category is to make a huge mistake in historical understanding. So we have these profound statements. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word. All things came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be that came to be. And actually, that is a very profound answer to Richard Dawkins' great question, who created the creator? But if you can't immediately see it, ask me about it in the question session. Okay, because we must move on to the next thing. I've said problem number one that's created a huge intellectual fog is what do we mean by God? Secondly, what do we mean by explanation? Now, I'm at heart a linguist. I wanted to be a classicist, then I wanted to be a modern linguist, then I wanted to be a, an electrical engineer and study information, and then I was told I could only get into Cambridge if I did maths, so I did maths. But I've kept all those interests going, and the interesting thing is explanation began to fascinate me. Because often today it is, look, science explains, you don't need anything more. Sci but what does it explain? So let's take the law of gravity, since we've used it before. What does it explain? Now, when I first met it at school, I'm afraid my physics teacher was not very good, but don't tell anybody. He told me that it explained gravity. It took many years before I realized it doesn't. Newton, non fingo hypothesi. I don't profess to understand gravity. I can give you a law which enables you to do brilliant calculations on gravitational attraction between large bodies and you can land a, a rocket on the moon even without Einsteinian corrections using it. But I don't know what it is. Now, if you're skeptical about that, just read Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, who said, don't let anybody kid you. Nobody knows what energy is. Nobody knows what gravity is. Isn't that fascinating? I was so fascinated when I discovered that. Everybody believes in gravity, and nobody knows what it is. That's a very interesting situation for a scientist to be in, isn't it? But that's the way things are. Many of the ultimate realities, the deep things that we deal with in physics, we don't know what they are. 
but we know enough about equations and laws governing them that we can do brilliant things with them, even though we're no closer to knowing what they are. Ludwig Wittgenstein is the man that got it dead right when he said this. The great delusion of modernity is that the laws of nature explain the universe for us. The laws of nature describe the universe, they describe the regularities, but they explain nothing. Fascinating, isn't it? So even in science, if you say, I've got an explanation, it's the law of gravity, it only gives you a limited range of explanation. It's not exhaustive. Let me illustrate it again with something different. Why is the water boiling? Well, the heat energy is being conducted through the copper base of the kettle, and it's agitating the molecules, and they're going faster and faster, and that's why it's boiling. Is it? No, it's not. It's boiling because I'd love a cup of tea. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? Well, you're laughing because I say, no, that's not the reason. Of course it's the reason. But the scientific explanation is not the same as the personal explanation. Now tell me, which of those two explanations is more important? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? I want a cup of tea is far more important. The heat explanation is important in a physics lesson, but not outside it. People have been boiling and brewing tea for thousands of years before they knew anything about heat equations and the transmission of heat and conduction. The point I'm making, ladies and gentlemen, is so simple that many professors can't see it. I find school kids can see it instantly. There are different levels of explanation. The explanation scientifically, in terms of law and mechanism, does not contradict the explanation in terms of personal agency. They complement one another. Now, what we're being told by some of these people who move in the direction of scientism, that the only valid explanation is a scientific one. Well, that's obviously nonsense. And that's true in a whole range of things. So you can summarize what I've just said. Both the explanations are necessary, they complement, they don't conflict, and the personal is more important than the scientific. Now, follow this carefully. Newton's law of gravitation no more competes with God as an explanation of the universe than the law of internal combustion competes with Henry Ford as an explanation of the motor car. You need both in each case. And one of my colleagues at Oxford, the philosopher Richard Swinburne, says, I do not deny that science explains, but I postulate God to explain why science explains. The very success of science in showing us how deeply orderly the natural world is provides strong grounds for believing that there is an even deeper cause for that order. So explanation, is that all to be said about explanation? No, there's much more. And now it gets very interesting because, again, I was taught in early science lessons that Explanation to be valid must always proceed from the simple to the complex. It must be reductionist. That is, you take something complicated and you explain it in terms of things that are simpler. Now, it's marvelous when you can do that. And there are many areas that you can do it in. But listen to Richard Dawkins objecting. He says, using God as an explanation is absurd since God is by definition more complex than the thing you are explaining. Now that sounds a pretty powerful argument until you apply it to Richard Dawkins himself, which I did. I pick up a book, it's called The God Delusion. It's quite complex, it's about 400 pages long. And I ask, what is the origin of this book? And somebody suggests, just imagine, suggests that this book originates in the infinitely more complex mind of Richard Dawkins. And I said, that's no explanation, because your explanation is more complex than the thing you're explaining. You see, it simply doesn't work. It's a non-argument. Why is it a non-argument? Why is it a non-argument? Because it's in an area where explanation always flows the other way. 
And that is where language is involved. Dawkins' book has a semiotic content. It is words with meaning. Let me illustrate it even more simply. Suppose I was going through a cave in China and saw those two marks on the cave wall. And I just go straight past them, but I've got a Chinese archaeologist with me. And she says, stop, 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 look at that. Human intelligence. And I say, don't be so stupid. Those are two scratches on a wall. And you're postulating the human mind to account for them. And she says, listen, uh, where were you educated? Oh, Cambridge, oh, I see. Um, what nonsense. Do you know that actually is a Chinese ideogram, run, which means a human being. And because it's got semiotic content, even though there are only two scratches, I've got to postulate a mind behind it. That doesn't stop science. The next question is, what sort of civilization produced it? What kind of mind? And so on. So we inference goes immediately upwards to mind when we see language. And I test this, you know, with my colleagues in Oxford, like this. We have a nice college, and we have lovely dinners, you see. And the trouble is, sometimes, you're assigned a place, and you're not allowed to move. And this night, I had a brilliant biochemist who was assigned to sit beside me, and he didn't like it at all, because he asked me what I did. And I said, I'm a pure mathematician. He said, how dreadfully boring. <laughs> and I thought, gosh, this isn't very good. So I said, oh, well, I know my subject is a bit socially, you know, not the kind of thing you talk at dinner table. Yes, he said, it is. Well, I said, look, uh, I make up for that by being interested in the big questions. He said, what big questions? And I was getting a bit nervous, you know, because dinner guest, he came from outside the college. Well, I said, you know, what about the universe as a scientist? Where does science fit in? What's the status of the universe? Is it created or not? Oh, he said, stop, it's far worse than I thought. <laughs> he said, listen, I'm an atheist, I'm a reductionist, we've nothing to talk about, we're going to have an absolutely miserable evening. Wow, that was a challenge. So I said, we're going to have a great evening. He said, how's that? Well, I said, I'm fascinated by reductionism. He said, are you? I said, I know at least three kinds. Which kind are you? Well, he said, well, I, I mean, it's our method. We split big problems up into little problems and we solve the little problems. Yes, I said, you're a methodological reductionist. So am I. That's what I do in mathematics every day. So we have something to talk about. But he says, you know what I mean. That's not what I mean. I said, I know exactly that's not what you mean. You're an ontological reductionist as well. Ontos, Greek for being. You think that everything is reducible to physics and chemistry. He said, exactly. Well, I said, let's do an experiment. He said, what here at the dining table? I said, sure, this is Oxford. What do you expect? <laughs> so we picked up the menu, and there's the menu. And he read down it, asparagus soup, roast chicken. I said, how do you know it's roast chicken? Well, he says, says so. But those are just marks on paper. How, I mean, how do you connect those with chickens? Well, he said, I suppose it's because I've independently learned English. You're a reductionist, I said, yes. Everything in terms of physics and chemistry, yes. Well, I said, have a go at this. You explain to me how those marks, R-O-A-S-T, carry the meaning of roast chicken, only using the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And there was dead silence. And his wife was there. And <laughs> she said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but you know, he wouldn't mind me telling you this because the honesty of his reply absolutely stunned me. He said, John, you know, he was getting friendly now, you could see. For 40 years, I've gone into my lab in Oxford thinking that could be done. I was just devastated. He said, it can't be done. But I said, physics and chemistry have only been going a few hundred years. He said, it doesn't matter. It's not within the explanatory power of physics and chemistry to cope with meaning. You've got to postulate a mind. I nearly said to him, you mean a mind of the gaps? 
Ah, but it isn't, you see. Postulating a mind is making an inference to the best explanation. A mind is a better explanation for a menu than unguided natural processes, isn't it? But now here came the hard bit. Because you see, this man was an expert in this stuff. Do you recognize that? That constitutes, amongst other things, the longest word we've ever discovered. Three and a half billion letters long. So, of course, being an innocent abroad, I started to ask more questions. Here's a word, and we use computer language to describe it as semiotic. It codes for something, for proteins. So I asked him about this. What about this? What's behind this, ultimately? Well, he said, only chance and necessity. I said, what? You mean chance and the laws of nature? He said, absolutely. I said, why didn't you say that about roast chicken? You see a five-letter word, and you postulate intelligence. You see a 3.5 billion-letter word, and you postulate chance and necessity. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Now, that's apart from all natural processes that may or may not have been involved. You're looking at it in a way like a black box, and stamped all over it is semiotics and mind. Now, my final point is this. C.S. Lewis drew my attention to this. He says we've done brilliant science by thinking, but we haven't done enough thinking about thinking. So let's think about thinking. You think of what mathematics has done. There are these wonderful equations that give us a handle on so many disparate fields. And Einstein, the great genius, once said, the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. He was clever enough to see, as was Wigner, who won the Nobel Prize, that there's something odd. And Wigner wrote, the enormous usefulness of mathematics is something bordering on the mysterious. There's no rational explanation for it. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulations of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Is he right? Is mathematics unreasonably effective? I want to argue that it is if you're a naturalist, but it's not if you're a theist. Now, I was taught quantum mechanics by Professor Sir John Polkinghorne. And in his books, he is careful to point out that physics cannot explain its fundamental beliefs, notice the word belief, in the mathematical intelligibility of the universe for the very simple reason that you need to believe the universe is mathematically intelligible before you start doing any physics at all. It's an absolute fundamental of your faith as a physicist. So let me build on the story of the menu to come laterally at it in a way that I have devised recently to have an interesting conversation with colleagues. I asked them what they do science with. And of course they say, well, I've got a billion dollar cyclotron. I said, I don't mean that. I mean, oh, they say, you mean? And they're about to say, my mind, when they remember there's no such thing as the mind. So they say, my brain. Well, I say, yes, I actually think the mind story and the brain story are different, but we'll not go down that path. I'll accept for the moment what you say. You do science with your brain. Yes. I said, that's very interesting. Tell me about the brain. And they're all ready to give me a very long story, but I say, I want the short story. When you focus down, tell me about the brain. Well, he said, in the end, we've got to face it, the brain is the end product of a series of mindless, unguided processes. And I then look at them and say, and you trust it. And you trust it. Tell me, if you knew your computer was the end product of a series of mindless, unguided processes, would you trust it? And of course, they immediately say no. I said, why do you trust this? And they say, what are you getting at? Well, I said, what I'm getting at is Darwin's doubt have you ever heard of Darwin's doubt? With me, he wrote, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind which has been developed from the mind of lower animals are of any value 
are at all trustworthy. And he goes on to say, what would you make of the convictions in a monkey's mind if there were any convictions in such a mind? It bothered Darwin. It bothers leading philosophers today in a very big and increasing way. Because, you see, the problem here is that, as Alvin Plantinga put it, one of the world's most distinguished philosophers, he's a Christian, and uh, was at Notre Dame, if Dawkins is right that we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties, and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own atheism. So what we're getting at is this, that their explanation of their brain reducing it to physics and chemistry and the mind to the firing of neurons is now beginning to undermine the validity of the rationality they're using to set up their theories in the first place. Now this has become a serious question because Thomas Nagel of New York has taken it up. Thomas Nagel has written a book with the most explosive title I have ever read in my entire life, and there you see it. Mind and Cosmos. Why the Neo-Darwinian view of the world is almost certainly false. Now, Nagel is not only a brilliant philosopher, he is a hard atheist. He writes and says, I don't want there to be a god. I don't want the universe to be that way. But he's very honest about the limited powers of naturalism and the in improbability, indeed impossibility, of reducing the mental to the physical, which you must be able to do if all we've got ultimately is mass energy. And he says, if the ma mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture in which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. And Polkinghorne puts the same thing this way. The very assertions of the reductionist himself are nothing but blips in the neural network of the brain. The world of rational discourse dissolves into the absurd chatter of firing synapses. Quite frankly, that cannot be right, and none of us believes it to be so. So as I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say something that may strike you as very unusual. The question before us was, has science buried God? My answer is absolutely not. In fact, it was believing in God that drove science. But now I'm going to say that science buries atheism. That you can't hold those two together in a mix. Because the one undermines the other. Atheism, taken to its reductionist extreme, undermines the validity of any rational discourse at all, including science. Let me repeat that. Science has not buried God. Science points towards God. But atheism is in danger of burying science. Now, of course, that doesn't mean there aren't brilliant atheists doing science, but there's a a mismatch down at the bottom when we think about thinking. And I notice it's only relatively recently. And C.S. Lewis saw it in the 1940s, and nobody much noticed it. He said, look, any theory depends on assuming the validity of human rationality. And any theory that brings rationality into doubt cannot be true because we reach it by thinking. And if thinking is invalid, the whole thing collapses. So, ladies and gentlemen, what is my conclusion? My conclusion is this, that the evidence of the mathematical describability of the universe, you can write the universe in a way and encapsulate it in written equations. In biology, you can write, not everything, but large properties of life in a word. This is a word-based universe. And therefore, this statement in the New Testament, in the beginning was the Word. All things came to be through Him. That is mass energy or derivative. That's one worldview. That's the one I believe. 
The alternative is, in the beginning was mass energy or whatever, and mind is derivative. And it's not only as a Christian, but as a scientist, that I believe the worldview up there is infinitely preferable to the other. My main reason, you see, for not being an atheist is not because I'm a Christian. I mean, that's pretty obvious that I won't be an atheist. It's because I'm a scientist. I want a valid grounds for trusting what it is in here that enables me to study the universe. Thank you very much. So as uh, Professor Lennox mentioned at the beginning of the question, you should all have gotten a comment card on your seat. Hopefully during the talk you were filling out questions. Um, what we would like to do now is take a few moments to let you gather your thoughts and collect those questions, and then we're going to move into our Q&A section. What we're going to do here is alternate questions between this audience that has been written on the card and will be collected, which we'll give to Professor Lennox as well as questions from our Twitter feed from the live simulcast. We're going to, during the Q&A session, alternate questions from these two forms. So like I said, everyone has a card, and please fill that in with your questions. We'd also also to have your name, cell phone number, any other information that you are willing to provide on this card, that can be an email address. You also notice in the, in the center there's a box that says, count me in. If you, after listening to Professor Lennox today, want to reconsider your previous answer to the question, has science buried God, and would like to hear more about the Christian faith and the God that Professor Lennox spoke of, please check this box, and we'd love to talk with you more. We have members from InterVarsity and Campus Crusade who would love to meet with you in the weeks to come to have coffee and just discuss what you've heard. So in the next few moments, as you fill out your questions, Professor Lennox, if you don't mind, I have a question for you. OK, and please write so as I can read. And remember, I'm old, and my eyesight is getting dim. So write <laughs> clearly, and try to write briefly, so that we can get through as many as possible. OK? Great. So fill those out, and we'll have them collected. In the meantime, I will, I will ask my question. Oh, you're going to ask yours yes. now. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you spoke about science and God, and atheism and theism, and you said that um, science and God can coexist. You also mentioned a lot C.S. Lewis, and it brought to mind a quote of his that I like and want to share and ask a follow-up question. The quote is from Mere Christianity, and C.S. Lewis said, you must make your choice. Either Jesus was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. Let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. So in your talk, you said science and God can exist together. Perhaps not atheism and theism, but science and God. My question is then, do you agree with C.S. Lewis's statement that one is forced to choose between the Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, either as Lord and Savior or as a madman, or can one let the question be at rest and not choose? Well, my response to that is that this is a question that goes beyond this lecture. Because what I have tried to establish is that science and God are perfectly compatible. But once we begin to talk about Christ, we're talking about Christianity. We're talking about historical specifics. And you cannot get that from science. And so that opens up a whole new field. You need evidence of a different kind. And what I'm going to do, if you don't mind, because the questions are now pouring in, 
I'm going to come to that question because it's so important later on in the Q&A, if I may do that. Yes. And we'll look at um, <clears throat> some of these questions which um, are, let's have a quick, right, now we've got plenty. Let me just have a quick glance so as we can put them in some sort of sensible order. Okay, well, this might be a useful one to start with because it's historical. Um, and it says, how can we view Christianity as being a proponent of science where the church blocked many of the new developments in the Enlightenment era? Um, and, of course, they're thinking of Galileo and uh, the idea that the world is flat, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's an important question. And questions about history can usually be cleared up by studying history. And I'm just going to give you the one example of Galileo. Because it's commonly supposed that the church was obscurantist, persecuted poor old Galileo, um, uh, who was an atheist and so on. And that shows us that science is at war with religion. Well, firstly, Galileo was a believer in God. I quoted him in God there. And he never stopped believing in God. He also believed in Scripture. Secondly, it wasn't the Roman Catholic Church that first attacked Galileo. It was the Italian philosophers. And why did they do that? Because he was raising questions about Aristotle. Aristotle's view that the earth didn't move had dominated European thought for centuries. The mistake the church made was it jumped on the bandwagon and it found verses in the Bible to support Aristotle. God has set the earth on its pillars that it should not be moved. There you are, they say the Bible agrees with Aristotle. But you see, Galileo was challenging Aristotle. So the philosophers hit him first, the church hit him second. That's point number one. He was questioning a reigning scientific paradigm. All right? Secondly, he was a silly man. Because he had befriended the man who became pope, but then he wrote a book and he put the view of the pope, that is the Aristotelian view, into the mouth of a character he called Simplicius, the fool. Well, that wasn't very good PR with the Vatican. Next, he wrote in Italian and insisted on it when everybody knew that scholars must write in Latin. People didn't like that either. So he made himself thoroughly unpopular. But historians of science are agreed on this. You must not use the story of Galileo to illustrate a war between science and religion because it doesn't. And actually, Galileo was put under house arrest in a delightful villa. He was never persecuted, tortured, or anything else. And it's interesting that, because the other great debate that happened at the Natural History Museum between Wilberforce and Huxley is likewise a caricature. The ignorant bishop using theological arguments against the brilliant scientist Huxley. But if you read, as I have, the whole debate, Bishop Wilberforce was a brilliant amateur naturalist and Darwin said he's found all the weaknesses in my theory. He says near the beginning, I'm not going to use biblical arguments. I'm going to use scientific arguments in this. So you analyze it and you find it doesn't establish the idea of a war between science and Christianity. Now where I will agree with the questioner is this. There's not the slightest excuse for doing what was done to Galileo or anybody else. That's clear but that it doesn't fit in to the kind of paradigm um, God against science is very well established by historians. Read John Henley Brook or uh, Peter, what's his name, who was the professor afterwards. Gosh, you'll have to stay at what's his name because I've forgotten anymore. Now, is your evidence-based faith falsifiable by any historical or scientific discovery? Of course it is. Of course it is. I wouldn't take Christianity very seriously if it wasn't falsifiable, because it makes claims about space, time, and history. 
For instance, let me take a simple one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We don't think about that these days, but I did in the 1960s. You know, I existed in the 1960s. Would, would you believe that? At the same time as John Lennon, but I'm not John Lennon, as you say, I'm John Lennox, but that's another story. Um, in the 1960s, there was a startling discovery made, a little bit earlier than that, because it was beginning within cosmology, there was beginning to be stronger and stronger evidence that there was a beginning to space-time. The shift of the galaxies, the red shift, the expansion of the universe, and then finally, the Nobel Prize winning discovery of the microwave background. Now, do you know what happened? Well, you don't, you weren't there. It was in England in the 1960s. When it was suggested that we're being forced in science to believe in a beginning to space time, it was resisted at the highest scientific level. The following editorial appeared in Nature. John Maddox, editor. We must not go down the route of believing in a beginning to space time. Why? Because it'll give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. The greatest advance in cosmology in the 20th century was resisted because it paralleled what the Bible had been saying for thousands of years. And I was once in a very famous laboratory, which I cannot name, with some very distinguished scientists whom I also cannot name. And we were discussing this. And I made a statement in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And a professor, very eminent one, interrupted me. And he said, look, Professor Physics, he said, Professor Lennox, please tell us you were joking when you said the Bible had something to say about science. Because it's not a textbook of science. Well, I said, you're right about the second thing. It's not a textbook of science. I have never, ever taught calculus from the book of Leviticus. <laughs> but I said, the mistake you're making is, although it's pre-modern scientific by definition, it was written centuries ago, it has a certain limited number of statements about the same universe you study. And one of them is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's talking about the universe you study. Now I said, may I make a gentle suggestion? If you had taken the biblical worldview more seriously, you could have make, made a testable prediction on the basis of it. In other words, you could have looked for evidence before you did that there was a beginning to space-time. But because you were so pressured by Aristotelianism, you left it until the 20th century to do it. So what am I claiming? I'm claiming here's a statement in the beginning. There was a beginning that's testable. We can decide whether it's true or not. Now, I know science moves and so on, but I do believe with most of my fellow scientists, I'm a critical realist. There is truth out there. It can be accessed. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting nearer and nearer to it. So it is important to realize that it is falsifiable. The central claim of Christianity is that Jesus rose physically from the dead. Well, if he's found in a cave somewhere with details and all the rest of it, then you would have to seriously question that belief. Falsifiability, of course, is important, as is testability, but I'll come to that a little bit later. Right. Now, there's one question, two questions. Let's see. That question is highly relevant. Gosh, there are about 100 questions now. Right, there's three questions on the same topic. I bet there are about 10 more. Where do science and rationality, I'm trying to choose questions that are very different from each other. Uh, why, where do science and rationality fall short in terms of explaining the universe if human logic is flawed? Well, that kind of a statement raises more questions than it solves. What do you mean it's flawed? 
Is it necessarily flawed? Why should it be flawed? The kind of logic we use every day is very scarcely likely to be flawed. But the important part of the question is in the first statement. Where does science and rationality fall short? One of the great confusions of the modern um, age is that science and rationality are coextensive, and that science is the only way to truth. Well, if science and rationality are coextensive, and science is the only way to truth, you better shut down half the faculties of the University of Chicago tomorrow. Because history goes, linguistics goes, economics goes, uh, and so on and so forth. Rationality is much bigger than science. Theology is rational, at least I hope it is. Listening to some of them, you'd wonder. But uh, you know what I mean. It is a rational discipline, thinking about God organizing ideas about God. So my response to this is, it's not so much they fall short in terms of explaining the universe, is that science is successful because it only asks a limited kind of question. So now we take another matrix, ethics, and we use that to quiz the universe. That's very different from science. At least I hold that. Sam Harris doesn't, but that's a dispute between us about which, we have writ about which I have written. That yields other things. Ethics is a rational discipline. Theology and so on. And what I'm saying to you is this. Our exploration of the universe in terms of science is not in terms of science. It's in terms of sciences, which are a set of disciplines. But then we must go beyond them. We've got to add history in. We're not just studying what happens at the moment in terms of empirical science and experimentation. We have historical science. What happened in the past? You can't repeat it in the laboratory. You've got to make an inference to the best explanation as to what happened, and so on. So the next thing is, is there a higher category or another category? What do I mean by that? Science, literature, art, they're all explorations of the universe by the human mind. Is there anything else? If there is a God behind the universe, could it be that if he is the word, he speaks and communicates? That's what we call revelation. Now, please, don't take the foolish way out and say revelation is opposed to reason, like Richard Dawkins. We trust in reason not in holy books, as if you could read a holy book without using a reason. I mean, that's just plain silly. The point is, and here I may speak as a Christian, is that what I claim is there are two sources of evidence about the universe, and on both of them we use our reason. The one is the natural world, the book of God's world, as Roger Bacon put it, Francis Bacon put it. And the book of God's word, it claims to be revelation, God speaking to us. Now, let me give you a, a, a lower level illustration. Suppose you want to get to know me. Why you'd ever want to do that, I don't know. But suppose you did. Well, you could put me on a table here and inside a scanning, tunneling microscope. You could do CAT scans up and down and up and down until your head was silly and you could study them. Would you get to know me? No. The only way you get to know me is if I reveal myself to you. Isn't that right? Now, tell me, when I start revealing myself to you, which is usually done by speech, do you shut your reason off? Well, of course not. You use your reason to see if I'm making sense. That's what you're doing now. Now, I hope I am. Could it be that God's done that? That... Instead of just leaving us to search for him, he has spoken into space-time. Now, of course, you may well be aware that the central claim of Christianity is that God has encoded himself into humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's the central claim, that Christ is God incarnate, come to speak to us, to tell us what God is like in terms that we can understand. We are humans, he's human, never merely human, never only human, but certainly human. 
So this business of rationality is important. We use it in every area, but we've got to expand our horizon. Now, of course, if you assume naturalism, then revelation by definition is nonsense. But you can lock yourself in a castle very easily that way. At university like this, it's a good thing to be open to the possibilities and listen, for example, to what Christianity says before you write it off. Now, let's see about this. How many scientists include their theistic beliefs in their actual peer-reviewed literature? Almost none. By definition, when I teach in the University of Oxford or anywhere else uh, and get up to teach algebra, I don't write in the blackboard in the beginning, God create the heavens and the earth, because I'm paid to teach mathematics. And when I write papers on mathematics, I don't include things about God because my subject doesn't relate to God. At any other level than the meta level, why I believe it can be done, but that's not what I'm writing a paper about. You see, what often we don't realize is that 99.999% of science isn't interested in this issue. It's discovering how this little bit works or where it fits in or why does that star pulsate and, 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 and so on. Or what is this creature? It's not talking about God at all. And so there are very few, but there are many Christians who are scientists. Now, sometimes a scientist will put in front of a book, Soli Deo Gloria. And that is, means only to the glory of God, which means they're dedicating the book, like they might to their wife or their children. They do it to God. But God doesn't appear in the peer-reviewed articles. That does not mean that either, A, that they don't believe in him, and it doesn't mean there are good arguments for him. It just means that it's not the concern of the particular paper on internal combustion that they happen to be writing at the moment. Does that make sense to you? Right. Where are we going to go now? There are one, two, three, four, five questions on the age of the earth. Who wants me to say something about the age of the earth? Put up your hands if you want me to say something about this. I've had five questions about it, so I'd better. The Genesis begins with a story, as you know. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then there follows a sequence of days. Do you remember that bit? And one of the questions says, well, science says the exact opposite. It tells us that the earth is over 4 billion years old. The universe is about 13.7 or 7.5. I don't know what the yesterday's version was, but that kind of order of magnitude. And here's the Bible claiming that the universe and the earth are young. Does it? Does it? Now, let me make it very clear. I take scripture extremely seriously. And it's because I take it seriously that I'm going to make a desperately provocative statement. I don't think it says anything about the age of the earth whatsoever. And why is that? Well, it's quite a simple argument, actually. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There are two introductory verses, and then you have a sequence of days. And God said, let there be light, day one. And God said, day two. And God said, day three. And God said, five, six. And then, and God rested. Yes? Each day, then, begins with, and God said. The book does not begin with, and God said. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is not day one. That's the first thing to notice, simply from the text. Forget science altogether. We're looking at this seriously as a text and what it's claiming. Point number two, the different past tenses in Hebrew bear different weights. The first two verses are in one past tense, and then it changes to the narrative tense for the days. What does that mean? Well. To be fair, I asked the professor of Hebrew at Cambridge, and I asked the professor of Hebrew at Oxford, and they agreed. <laughs> and they told me, they told me that um, that means that the events recorded at the beginning occurred before the sequence of days. 
How long before? The Bible doesn't say, so I'm not going to say. I believe it's as simple as that. Taking the language seriously as at what it says. Now, I understand people, and my heart goes out to them, really, who are put under pressure sometimes in their churches. This is Christians. That if they don't accept the, a young earth interpretation of Genesis, they're not Christians at all. That is a very sad thing to do. Because for centuries there have been problems here. And I notice that among Christians who are like me, utterly convinced that there was a creation, that Christ pre-existed, that he became incarnate, that he did his miracles, that he rose from the dead, that he ascended, believe all those. People who believe all those, but they differ in Genesis 1. And I've written down about 25 different interpretations. The young earth one, by the way, comes from my home city in Ireland. I shouldn't have told you that, should I? But that's where it comes from. Where people disagree, who are men and women of equal conviction, you may be sure that it's not an easy matter. Now, just a word about the days, because I've got to stop in a minute or two. These days... People say, well, look, a day is a day is a day. It's a 24-hour day. Is it? Well, let me tell you, what is the first mention of day in Genesis? And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. What length is that? Huh, how long is that? It's less than 24 hours. It's 12 at the equator, isn't it? The very first mention of day in Genesis is not a 24-hour day. And that points out the multivalency of the word day. The second mention of the word day, evening and morning one day, which, although there's argument about it, is probably the way that Hebrews refer to what we call a 24-hour day, so that's number two. And then day seven, there's no formula, and there was evening and morning day seven. Why is that? Well, people as far back as Augustine said, well, you see, God created and he rested from creating, but he hasn't started creating again. He's not been doing any creating since the beginning of creation, so that day's been very, very long indeed. It's lasted up until now. And I discover when I push people that most Christians believe that God is still resting from creation, but he's doing other things as well. He's redeeming people and so on. So there's another kind of day. And then finally, chapter 2, verse 4, says, in the day God created the earth and heaven, but it's translated into English by when, so we miss it. It's the word day. What day was that? The first? All six? You know, in my young day at Cambridge, we had to be back in college at 11 o'clock at night. Can you believe that? But we did. Would you say to me, in your young day, was that Tuesday or Saturday? Don't be stupid. The word day is also an expression for an indefinite period of time in the past. So in Genesis 1 and 2, you have four meanings for the word day. Be very careful how you interpret it. Now, the crunch comes when we look even closer at the grammar. Because, you see, we read our English Bible, the first day, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. That's what it doesn't say. It says either day one or a first day. Day two, day three, day four, day five, the sixth day, the seventh. There's a definite article in Hebrew, ha, hayom, the day. Now, if you were describing simply an ordinary earth week sometime in the past, you'd either use no article or all of them with a the definite article. It doesn't. That opens up a whole new possibility. God speaks. Something happens, day one. God speaks again, something happens, day two. How much space is there between the days? I don't know. It's clearly not an ordinary earth week. But it is parallel with an earth week. I mean, obviously, day seven doesn't end. I wish our earth weeks were like that, you know. You work for six days and then you retire. That would be marvelous. <laughs> that would be absolutely marvelous. But people who try to draw straight lines, it doesn't work. Now, I must stop here on that. I have one more question to answer, to be fair, to the noble lady who started us off. Um, the, 
I've written a book about this because I wrote it for North America, for students like yourselves, because I met so many people conflicted, particularly in Stanford, incidentally. So many people conflicted that I thought I'd write a book about it. It's called Seven Days That Divide the World. Have a look at it and see what you think. But I must be fair and come to this um, question that you asked referring to C.S. Lewis. And I love questions about C.S. Lewis because I used to listen to him. Yes, I'm that old. Lewis said that Jesus Christ causes a dividing of opinions. You can't just say he was a good teacher for very obvious reasons because he stood on planet Earth 20 centuries ago and he said, I am the truth. If one of your friends in the University of Chicago came to you tomorrow and said, excuse me, do you know who I am? I am the truth. What, you mean you're like Harvard, very toss. You're the truth. I think you'd cut them off to the nearest psychiatric institution. And what Jesus did not mean was simply that he said true things. He's saying, I am the truth. What's the truth about this universe? Well, we can get scientific truth. We can get artistic truth. We can get historical truth. But as those questions go on digging deeper and deeper, every one of the chains of questions says Christ will come back to him. And he stands at the end of them and says, I am the truth. It's very difficult to see that he was an ordinary person. And this is the point Lewis is getting at. It's only a very superficial examination of the life of Christ that leads to this kind of thing when he was a very good teacher. Yes, he was a very good teacher, but he made fundamental claims about himself and himself in relation to the universe and to time. Imagine somebody else saying to you tomorrow in a physics class, by the way, we were discussing time this morning. Time's very interesting, you know. Before Abraham was, I am. What? Do you get it? They are huge claims. Now, how are we going to settle it? It's quite clear, as Lewis said, don't come around with some patronizing nonsense that he was a good teacher. Either he is utterly mad, but mad people don't behave like that. So we've got to investigate the evidence. Now, there are various events on in Chicago around this week, and there are lots of people around here who give you different aspects of this. But I want to finish on a kind of scientific note that's come up with me frequently, and it's in one of the earlier questions. The falsifiability question. The flip side of falsifiability is testability. And people have often said to me, at the end of an evening like this, they said, look, come off it, Professor Lennox. All this talk, you know, but We'd love to say that this stuff is testable, and of course it's not testable, isn't it? Isn't it? Of course it's testable. Let me give you an example of that. Christ stood on earth, and he met hurting people. He met friendless people. He met people who had big problems with evil and suffering. And he said, come to me. All of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. And they came to him, and what happened? They discovered that it, they received peace and rest. And what Jesus Christ said to the ancient world, he says to you and me, he tells me straight that he is going to be the judge in the last day. That tells you he's not merely human. And if I face the mess I've made in my own life and in the lives of others, and come to trust him as Savior and Lord, I receive what? Peace with God. Forgiveness. You're sitting there. What about forgiveness and guilt? Are they a big issue? They're a huge issue among young people today. And Christ says he can give us forgiveness and peace. I meet so many people and they've no peace. I was speaking at Penn State, and I didn't know there was a young Chinese student listening to me. And I went then, I think it was Harvard, weeks later, maybe months. And after I'd finished an evening like this, 
on the balcony, this student stood up and he yelled to the crowd, look at me. And of course, we were all staggered, you know. And I looked at him. He wanted me to look at him. And everybody looked at me. Look at me. And then he told us all. He said, I heard you speak at Penn State. My life was in a complete mess. I was falling apart. I had no hope. I was utterly miserable. And something you said resonated. And a few weeks later, I decided to commit my life to Christ. And he said, just look at me. And he was utterly radiant. And it said it all. Is Christianity testable? Of course it is. When I see young people, and they're in despair and disillusionment, and I don't meet them for a while, they come back and I see a complete difference. What on earth happened to you? They may use language like, I met Jesus, or I trusted Christ, or I received whatever language they use, it doesn't matter. When you see that not once, not twice, hundreds of times in your life, you begin to use your little logic and add two and two and get four. There's something in this. It actually works. And in the end, I wouldn't do these lectures if I didn't believe that it actually works. Because I firmly believe, and you may not never have heard a science professor say this in your lives, I firmly believe that if you tonight feel that you're in that kind of a position and ready to make that sort of commitment, you can experience peace with God and forgiveness and new life before you leave that, this building. That's how I really I believe this whole stuff is. Science only gets you so far. Then you must get much more specific because, ladies and gentlemen, God is not a theory. He's a person. And getting to know a person is a much bigger and, in the end, an infinitely more satisfying thing than getting to know a theory. Thank you so much for listening, and goodbye. All right, well, I hope you all enjoyed this evening. Remember to carry on the conversation over Twitter and to check out the other Festival of Thought events that are going on in Chicago this week. And also, if any of your questions were not answered during this talk, some of uh, Dr. Lennox's colleagues from Oxford and RZIM <laughs> uh, will remain at the front and they'll be able to answer your questions. And now before we go, uh, I would just like to lead a very short prayer for those who wish. Dear God, you are hard to understand. You can be hard to believe in. I just pray that tonight you have opened our minds and that you have increased our knowledge and our understanding and our faith just a little bit. And I pray that we can learn everything that we need to learn in order to make the right decision in life about whether you exist, and uh, whether science has buried you. Thank you, God. Thanks for everything. In your name we pray. Amen. Right. Have a good night. <laughs>